Section 20 of Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hans Christian Andersen, Fairy Tales and Short Stories, Volume 3, 1848-1853, by Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by H. P. Paul. Everything in the Right Place It is more than a hundred years ago. At the border of the wood, near a large lake, stood an old mansion. Deep ditches surrounded it on every side, in which reeds and bulrushes grew. Close by the drawbridge, near the gate, there was an old willow tree, which bent over the reeds. From the narrow pass came the sound of bugles and the tramping of horses' feet. Therefore a little girl who was watching the geese hastened to drive them away from the bridge, before the whole hunting party came galloping up. They came, however, so quickly, that the girl, in order to avoid being run over, placed herself on one of the high corner stones of the bridge. She was still half a child, and very delicately built. She had bright blue eyes and a gentle, sweet expression. But such things the baron did not notice. While he was riding past the little goose girl, he reversed his hunting crop, and in rough play gave her such a push with it that she fell backward into the ditch. "'Everything in the right place,' he cried. "'Into the ditch with you.' Then he burst out laughing, for that he called fun. The others joined in, the whole party shouted and cried, while the hounds barked. While the poor girl was falling, she happily caught one of the branches of the willow tree, by the help of which she held herself over the water, and as soon as the baron with his company and the dogs had disappeared through the gate, the girl endeavoured to scramble up, but the branch broke off, and she would have fallen backward among the rushes, had not a strong hand from above seized her at this moment. It was the hand of a peddler. He had witnessed what had happened from a short distance, and now hastened to assist her. "'Everything in the right place,' he said, imitating the noble baron, and pulling the little maid up to the dry ground. He wished to put the branch back in the place it had been broken off, but it is not possible to put everything in the right place. Therefore he stuck the branch into the soft ground. "'Grow and thrive if you can, and produce a good flute for them yonder in the mansion,' he said." It would have given him a great pleasure to see the noble baron and his companions well thrashed. Then he entered the castle, but not the banqueting hall, he was too humble for that. No, he went to the servants' hall. The men's servants and maids looked over his stock of articles and bargained with him. Loud crying and screaming were heard from the master's table above. They called it singing. Indeed, they did their best. Laughter and the howls of dogs were heard through the open windows. There they were feasting and reveling. Wine and strong old ale were foaming in the glasses and jugs. The favorite dogs ate with their masters. Now and then the squires kissed one of these animals, after having wiped its mouth first with the tablecloth. They ordered the peddler to come up, but only to make fun of him. The wine had got into their heads, and reason had left them. They poured beer into a stocking that he could drink with them, but quick. That's what they called fun, and it made them laugh. Then meadows, peasants, and farmyards were staked on one card and lost. Everything in the right place, the peddler said, when he had at last safely got out of Sodom and Gomorrah, as he called it. The open high road is my right place. Up there I did not feel at ease. The little maid, who was still watching the geese, nodded kindly to him as he passed through the gate. Days and weeks passed, and it was seen that the broken willow branch which the peddler had stuck into the ground near the ditch remained fresh and green. Nay, it even put forth fresh twigs. The little goose girl saw that the branch had taken root, and was very pleased. The tree, so she said, was now her tree. While the tree was advancing, everything else at the castle was going backward, through feasting and gambling, for these are two rollers upon which nobody stands safely. Less than six years afterwards, the baron passed out of his little castle gate a poor beggar, while the baronial seat had been bought by a rich tradesman. 
he was the very peddler they had made fun of and poured beer into a stocking for him to drink but honesty and industry bring one forward and now the peddler was the possessor of the baronial estate from that time forward no card playing was permitted there that's a bad pastime he said when the devil saw the bible for the first time he wanted to produce a caricature in opposition to it and invented card playing the new proprietor of the estate took a wife and whom did he take the little goose girl who had always remained good and kind and who looked as beautiful in her new clothes as if she had been a lady of high birth and how did all this come about that would be too long a tale to tell in our busy time but it really happened and the most important events have yet to be told it was pleasant and cheerful to live in the old place now the mother superintended the household and the father looked after things out of doors and they were indeed very prosperous where honesty leads the way prosperity is sure to follow the old mansion was repaired and painted the ditches were cleaned and fruit trees planted all was homely and pleasant and the floors were as white and shining as a pasteboard in the long winter evenings the mistress and her maids sat at the spinning wheel in the large hall every sunday the counsellor this title the peddler had obtained although only in his old days read aloud a portion from the bible the children for they had children all received the best education but they were not all equally clever as is the case in all families in the meantime the willow tree near the drawbridge had grown up into a splendid tree and stood there free and was never clipped it is our genealogical tree said the old people to their children and therefore it must be honored a hundred years had elapsed it was in our own days the lake had been transformed into marshland the whole baronial seat had as it were disappeared a pool of water near some ruined walls was the only reminder of the deep ditches and here stood a magnificent old tree with overhanging branches that was the genealogical tree here it stood and showed how beautiful a willow can look if one does not interfere with it the trunk it is true was cleft in the middle from the root to the crown the storms had bent it a little but it still stood there and out of every crevice and cleft in which wind and weather had carried mould blades of grass and flowers sprang forth especially above where the large boughs parted there was quite a hanging garden in which wild raspberries and hart's tongue ferns throve and even a little mistletoe had taken root and grew gracefully in the old willow branches which were reflected in the dark water beneath when the wind blew the chickweed into the corner of the pool a footpath which led across the fields passed close by the old tree high up on the woody hillside stood the new mansion it had a splendid view and was large and magnificent its window panes were so clear that one might have thought there were none there at all the large flight of steps which led to the entrance looked like a bower covered with roses and broad-leaved plants the lawn was as green as if each blade of grass was cleaned separately morning and evening inside in the hall valuable oil paintings were hanging on the walls here stood chairs and sofas covered with silk and velvet which could be easily rolled out on casters there were tables with polished marble tops and books bound in morocco with gilt edges indeed well-to-do and distinguished people lived here it was the dwelling of the baron and his family each article was in keeping with its surroundings everything in the right place was the motto according to which they also acted here and therefore all the paintings which had once been the honour and glory of the old mansion were now hung up in the passage which led to the servants rooms it was all old lumber especially two portraits one representing a man in a scarlet coat with a wig and the other a lady with powdered and curled hair holding a rose in her hand each of them being surrounded by a large wreath of willow branches both portraits had many holes in them because the baron's sons used the two old people as targets for their crossbows they represented the counsellor and his wife from whom the whole family descended 
but they did not properly belong to our family said one of the boys he was a peddler and she kept the geese they were not like papa and mamma the portraits were old lumber and everything in its right place that was why the great-grandparents had been hung up in the passage leading to the servants rooms the son of the village pastor was tutor at the mansion one day he went for a walk across the fields with his young pupils and their elder sister who had lately been confirmed they walked along the road which passed by the old willow tree and while they were on the road she picked a bunch of field flowers everything in the right place and indeed the bunch looked very beautiful at the same time she listened to all that was said and she very much liked to hear the pastor's son speak about the elements and of the great men and women in history she had a healthy mind noble in thought and deed and with a heart full of love for everything that god had created they stopped at the old willow tree as the youngest of the baron's sons wished very much to have a flute from it such as had been cut for him from other willow trees the pastor's son broke a branch off oh pray do not do it said the young lady but it was already done this is our famous old tree i love it very much they often laugh at me at home about it but that does not matter there is a story attached to this tree and now she told him all that we already know about the tree the old mansion the peddler and the goose girl who had met there for the first time and had become the ancestors of the noble family to which the young lady belonged they did not like to be knighted the good old people she said their motto was everything in the right place and it would not be right they thought to purchase a title for money my grandfather the first baron was their son they say he was a very learned man a great favorite with the princes and princesses and was invited to all court festivities the others at home love him best but i do not know why there seemed to me to be something about the old couple that attracts my heart how homely how patriarchal it must have been in the old mansion where the mistress sat at the spinning wheel with her maids while her husband read aloud out of the bible they must have been excellent sensible people said the pastor's son and with this the conversation turned naturally to noblemen and commoners from the manner in which the tutor spoke about the significance of being noble it seemed almost as if he did not belong to a commoner's family it is good fortune to be of a family who have distinguished themselves and to possess as it were a spur in oneself to advance to all that is good it is a splendid thing to belong to a noble family whose name serves as a card of admission to the highest circles nobility is a distinction it is a gold coin that bears the stamp of its own value it is the fallacy of the time and many poets express it to say all that is noble is bad and stupid and that on the contrary the lower one goes among the poor the more brilliant virtues one finds i do not share this opinion for it is wrong in the upper classes one sees many touchingly beautiful traits my own mother has told me of such and i could mention several one day she was visiting a nobleman's house in town my grandmother i believe had been the lady's nurse when she was a child my mother and the nobleman were alone in the room when he suddenly noticed an old woman on crutches come limping into the courtyard she came every saturday to carry a gift away with her there is the poor old woman said the nobleman it is so difficult for her to walk my mother had hardly understood what he said before he disappeared from the room and went downstairs in order to save her the troublesome walk for the gift she came to fetch of course this is only a little incident but it has its good sound like the poor widow's two mites in the bible the sound which echoes in the depth of every human heart and this is what the poet ought to show and point out more especially in our own time he ought to sing of this it does good it mitigates and reconciles but when a man simply because he is of noble birth and possesses a genealogy stands on his hind legs and neighs in the street like an arabian horse and says when a commoner has been in the room some people from the street have been here there nobility is decaying it has become a mask of the kind that thespis created and is amusing when such a person is exposed in satire 
Such was the tutor's speech. It was a little long, but while he delivered it he had finished cutting the flute. There was a large party at the mansion. Many guests from the neighborhood and from the capital had arrived. There were ladies with tasteful and with tasteless dresses. The big hall was quite crowded with people. The clergymen stood humbly together in a corner and looked as if they were preparing for a funeral, but it was a festival. Only the amusement had not yet begun. A great concert was to take place, and that is why the baron's young son had brought his willow flute with him, but he could not make it sound, nor could his father, and therefore the flute was good for nothing. There was music and songs of the kind which delight most those that perform them, otherwise quite charming. "'Are you an artist?' said a cavalier, the son of his father. "'You play on the flute, you have made it yourself. It is genius that rules. The place of honour is due to you.' "'Certainly not. I only advance with the time, and that, of course, one can't help.' "'I hope you will delight us all with the little instrument, will you not?' Thus saying, he handed to the tutor the flute which had been cut from the willow tree by the pool, and then announced in a loud voice that the tutor wished to perform a solo on the flute. They wished to tease him, that was evident, and therefore the tutor declined to play, although he could do so very well. They urged and requested him, however, so long, that at last he took up the flute and placed it to his lips. That was a marvellous flute! Its sound was as thrilling as the whistle of a steam engine. In fact, it was much stronger, for it sounded and was heard in the yard, in the garden, in the wood, and many miles round in the country. At the same time, a storm rose and roared, everything in the right place. And with this, the baron, as if carried by the wind, flew out of the hall straight into the shepherd's cottage, and the shepherd flew, not into the hall, thither he could not come, but into the servants' hall, among the smart footmen who were striding about in silk stockings. These haughty menials looked horror-struck that such a person ventured to sit at table with them. But in the hall the baron's daughter flew to the place of honour at the end of the table. She was worthy to sit there. The pastor's son had the seat next to her. The two sat there as if they were a bridal pair. An old count, belonging to one of the oldest families of the country, remained untouched in his place of honour. The flute was just, and it is one's duty to be so. The sharp-tongued cavalier, who had caused the flute to be played, and who was the child of his parents, flew headlong into the fowl house, but not he alone. The flute was heard at the distance of a mile, and strange events took place. A rich banker's family, who were driving in a coach and four, were blown out of it, and could not even find room behind it with their footmen. Two rich farmers who had in our days shot up higher than their own cornfields were flung into the ditch. It was a dangerous flute. Fortunately it burst at the first sound, and that was a good thing, for then it was put back into its owner's pocket, its right place. The next day nobody spoke a word about what had taken place. Thus originated the phrase, to pocket the flute. Everything was again in its usual order, except that the two old pictures of the peddler and the goose girl were hanging in the banqueting hall. There they were on the wall as if blown up there, and as a real expert said that they were painted by a master's hand, they remained there and were restored. Everything in its right place, and to this it will come. Eternity is long, much longer indeed than this story. End of section 20